Good morning to everybody. This is the time when we, uh, most of the time over uh, the course of the last few years, have dismissed our students. We're not doing that today. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are parents, you know that things are changing on that uh, over the next few weeks. And uh, next week actually is the last week uh, that we will be doing that. We're going to do it a little bit different. And uh, so we're looking forward to what God wants. So we had a great week last week as we experimented a little bit with our 1030 only service and uh, we're just looking forward to what uh, God wants to do. We really are. I've been encouraged already this morning. I don't know about you, but um, uh, that last song that we sang, um, powerful thought to know that we can look up because there is none above him and we can bow down because we absolutely need him. Uh, and this morning, we, we, we need to be reminded of that, and uh, some of us may not have to be reminded of that. Sometimes we have circumstances in our life that has already reminded us of that over and over again. Uh, but this morning, I, I want to say that um, we, we, we've talked a lot in our culture and in our society about this thing of bullying. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, when I was growing up, uh, and I was in uh, Penfield High School in junior high. Uh, I, I, I guess to say I was a little bit on the smaller side is a little bit of an understatement. My 29 slim pants looked more like parachute pants. Um, I, I really struggled to, to, to breach that 100. I think we actually had a, a party for me that day. Uh, but I, I think also that maybe I was a little bit underestimated because I can remember two situations in which there was somebody that was picking on my older sister. My sister is two years older than me, uh, and I don't even remember the circumstances, but I can remember the locations of both. One was in the city when we lived there on Fernwood Avenue, and one was uh, when we lived um, uh, an another place. Okay, my mind's already gone blank on that one. But I do remember this. They said something, and they were picking on her, and they were saying mean things to her. And all I know is this, that that twig kid left that situation with one person with a bloody nose, and it wasn't me. <laughs> I don't know how all of that happened, because those are the only two fights I can remember in all of my life. Uh, but bullying, bullying really is, as we think about it, is a very gigantic piece of what we would just call rejection. Uh, the society chooses who is acceptable and who is not for whatever reason that they're not acceptable, and like vultures, they start to pick on that person. It's a form of rejection. I think all of us understand rejection in some, some form or another, maybe not as much as others. M maybe it comes in the form of a relationship in your own home. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. They just don't seem to accept you. They seem to nitpick on you, and it's hurtful. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a, a child in your home that just doesn't seem to want to be there. Uh, maybe it's a, the downsizing of your job at work and you feel that sting of rejection. We all understand that to some point or another. What I want to do this morning is I want to open up a passage of Scripture. I want to counteract rejection with the promise of the unbelievable love and acceptance that God wants to offer to all of us. You can join me there in Luke chapter number 15. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of give a little bit of, of, of introduction and background before we actually read that, so you can make your way there. But Jesus is going to give three stories in direct response to the accusations and the scrutiny of some very staunchly religious people. We know them as the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were actually started out as a good, a good sect of society. They were there to protect the ways of God during the, the silent years before the New Testament, but they took things way too far. As a matter of fact, they began to become the bullies of the neighborhood. And if you didn't dress just the way they wanted you to, if you didn't act the way they expected you to, if you didn't respond the same way they were responding, then you were going to be picked on. You are going to be scrutinized. And standing in front of Jesus in this passage is a group of scrutinizers. They're looking at Jesus and they're picking apart what he is doing. Mixed in that crowd of Pharisees, though, is a very larger group of people that we know as publicans and sinners. And verse number one says it this way. It says, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners of that area to hear him. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So we have surrounding Jesus now, this group of, of, of needy people, people just like you and I that have problems in life. Maybe they've made some mistakes. We're not listed, we're not giving the list of, of their faults and their failures in life. We just know that they've got some problems. They've made some mistakes. And I think there's, all of us in here would just say, get in line, I've, I've got my share myself. And mixed in there is this group we call the Pharisees who are now scrutinizing, who are now bullying the publicans and the sinners. And Jesus is watching this happen, and he will not just sit on the side while this happens. And so Jesus is going to give three stories, two micro stories, two very small stories. And he's going to give a longer, more detailed, more passionate story at the end to, to, to give a lesson not only to the, to, the, to the publicans and to the sinners, but he's got a very important lesson for the bullies that are sitting there beside him. And uh, so we're going to take a moment to go through, through these, uh, these stories, but you're going to see four things that are common in all of the stories. Number one, something very valuable was, was lost. Number two, that valuable thing was sought for. Number three, that valuable item was dis- recovered. And then number four, there was a celebration. There was a celebration. In all of these stories, we're going to discover that God the Father is represented by the seeker, the one that is going at all lengths to find that which was lost. The lost item is going to represent, really, in the end, you and I. Someone who has, in one way or another, made those mistakes and and sinned those sins that we've chosen to do, and we have distanced distanced ourselves from God. And, uh, and so here, here we go. Let's go with the first story. You're going to see this in verses 4 through 7. The first micro story is, is about a man with a lost sheep. And, and the loss in this story was due to mischievous curiosity. Uh, whatever happened, this man had a hundred sheep, and he was making his way through the wilderness, finding a safe place to settle for the night. And when he got to that location, he discovered that he only had 99 of his sheep. One of them was missing. Now, it would make sense probably to most of us in our inexperience to say, well, at least I got 99 of them. I, I would say that's pretty good odds. I would say that's pretty good percentage. I did, a, I did a fairly good job. But that's not a picture of what the heart of God is. And God it pictured in this, this man, uh, he decides he is going to, dis, to, to recover that one lost sheep. He leaves the 99 safely in the fold, and he wanders off into the darkness to try and find where that that vulnerable sheep is located. That sheep is in trouble. And when he discovers that sheep, when he finds that sheep wherever it was, the Bible says in, in his kindness and in his love, he picked that sheep up, he put it around his shoulders, and he held that sheep close, and he made his way back to the rest putting that sheep right there, that sheep's head is resting right next to that, that, that man's cheek. And there's just a warmth there. There's an acceptance that is there. The sheep made all the mistake. It wasn't the man's fault. But that seeker, that man trying to find that which was lost, took that sheep, put him around his shoulders, and made his way back. Th- this really is a story of compassion and responsibility. It shows that God's love is for each individual, and he will go to all lengths to find that one lost sheep. Well, Jesus gives this story, and he looks, and uh, I, I believe he's just not convinced that the Pharisees are getting the point of the story. So he moves quickly into his second story. His second story is one of a woman with a lost coin. And you can see this in verses 8 through 10. This, the, the loss in this story is by misfortune and mistake. Uh, it, it says that this lady lost a coin, and on, uh, as we read that, if we're not really careful, we just think, well, big deal, I've lost a penny before. But what we learn from historians is, is that in, in the Jewish culture, they were given some of these coins that uh, is part of their dowry. So it really became something like a, a wedding ring or an engagement ring. This coin that this lady lost was very valuable and sentimental to her. And as soon as she discovered it was lost, she went into panic mode. I don't know if you've done this. I have. How many of you have ever misplaced your keys? I've done that. How many of you have um, misplaced your wallet? 
How many of you had to go on a rapid search for your cell phone? See, we understand, and maybe it's at that very immediate recognition that it is gone, that you're going, uh, I can't even remember where the last place was I had that. And you have that initial like, oh my word, it's my wallet, it's got a credit card. It's got my uh, whatever, I don't know what else you have hidden in there. We won't go through the lady's purse, because that's way too detailed. But we can understand that sense of, of panic when we recognize that something valuable has been lost, and this lady went directly into panic mode. And it, it, the, the Jesus tells in the story that she lit a candle immediately, she put on the flashlight, and she started to, she grabbed her, her, her broom, and she started to, to make her way through the house. With dust flying and her heart panting, she finally saw a glimmer shining in the sun, and she knew that was the lost coin. And it says that she grabbed that thing, and she not only did a personal celebration dance, but she called all of her friends and her neighbors together and said, I have found the missing coin. She was genuinely and passionately excited about the discovery that she had of this lost coin. This is really a story of, of desperation, a story of, of need. Now, it, it, I'm, I'm careful to say that God was desperate to find the lost sinner. I, I understand that. But I would say this, that he did act as a desperate seeker, doing everything that he could in his power to reach the sinners, including the death of his own son, Jesus. And this story is showing that passionate desire of Jesus to find, of God the Father, to find the lost people. Now, I, I don't think that the Pharisees are still getting the point at this, at this time. And Jesus is going to move now into the, the more passionate story, the, more, the, the, the bigger story of, of his lesson. It's the story of the prodigal son, probably one that most all of us know or have heard of at least at some point. And, and his story begins in verse number, tw uh, verse number 11. And the story begins with a, a young and very and carelessly adventurous young man whose heart left home long before his feet ever left the property. And the Bible tells us that he requested or demanded his portion of, of, of his inheritance. He wanted the money that was owed to him on the death of his father. And his dad, we don't give, we're not given all the story, but his dad gave him the money. And I'm going to tell you that there was a dagger stuck into that family and especially into the heart of that dad. And that son grabbed his money and he wandered off to the greener pastures of a city quite a ways from home. Not long after being there, he, he lived his dream, and then he lost everything. He was homeless, he was broke, and he was hungry, and he had no solution. And the story goes on to tell us that one night he was sitting there thinking and reminiscing, and he was thinking back to the times he had back home. He thought about the dinners at the family table, and he thought about the long talks with dad. He thought about his warm bed, and he thought this to himself. He said, if dad is anything like he was when I lived there, he'll accept me back. He'll forgive me. And, and, and this is a word to all of us who are parents or those that hope to be a parent. Never burn your bridges. You and I ought to be living in our, in our homes, in our areas of, of responsibility with such a heart that someone who does wander away can, can confidently sit there and say, if I go back, they won't throw stones. They won't hold all of this against me. They will forgive me and they will love me. Will there be consequences? Well, of course. There's always things that happen when we make our mistakes, when we wander off and we do the things that we want to do that are outside of the will of God. But, but the fact is, if we can live as responsible people to say, hey, if you come back, if you come to your senses, I'll be here for you. I'll be here for you. And this son remembered that. This son, this, this father actually lived that reputation for his son. And so here's where we pick up the story. We'll start reading in verse number 20. It says, and he rose, the son did, off in the far, far, far land, and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry for my son was, what's the word? He was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is, he is found. And they began to be merry. As Jesus begins this story of, the, of a father with a wayward son, well, I want to show you first a little bit about this forgiving father. And this father really is going to re represent for you and I as, as a church um, what we might call a generational missionary. Someone who has a passionate desire to see God reach and change the hearts of the next generation. Uh, we, we, we talked a, a couple Wednesdays ago about an Old Testament illustration of a king whose mo most and, and deepest concern was his own personal safety, his own personal pleasure. As long as peace and truth are in my days, he said, it's okay that my children are taken off into captivity. What a shallow thing to say, but at the end of that, we had to ask ourselves the question, do I exhibit that same heart? See, what, what do we do? What are we actively participating in to be a generational missionary? Someone who is passionate about reaching the next generation for Jesus Christ. What are we doing? So this, this is what we're going to see in this man's life. The first thing that we see is in, in this forgiving father is that he was proactive. Look at verse number 20. It says, and when he was yet a great way off when the sun was still off in the distance the dad didn't wait for uh, he didn't wait for the sun to make it down the road to the ranch i have this i have this feeling that uh the dad after a long day of work and, and listen he had to make up for a, a missing worker his son had been off for some time he had to make up for that after an exhausting day of work in my mind i picture this older father this aging man I, I can picture him getting his, his evening coffee or his tea, and I can just imagine him going out either to the porch or maybe to the split rail fence and just standing there and looking off into the distance, looking off in the same direction that his son disappeared over some weeks before, some months before. Probably every night he went out there hoping against all hope that his son was going to return. And one of the things that you and I can grab from this is don't let anybody steal your hope. You know what, sometimes in the circumstances we find ourselves in in life, hope's the only thing we've got. And, and some of us understand that completely. Don't let somebody else put a tombstone on your hope or on your circumstances until God has put one there. See, what, this man looked and he was watching in the distance, hoping for his son to return. His greatest desire was not for his son to be punished, not for his son to experience terrible circumstances or, 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 or retribution for what he did. His, what he wanted was his son to be reunited with him. He was proactive. He was involved. And he did not wait for his son to get down that road. The Bible tells us that he, that he went and he ran to meet his son. And in those days, they wore those robes. We don't understand this as well, but we know that, that they say what they had to do in order to run is they would grab the bottom of that robe and they would gather that robe up so that they wouldn't trip on that. And this aging man gathered his robe together and he started to trot down that road. And his trot soon turned into a, a run. And as he was getting closer, he couldn't even contain himself. And he finally got to his son. <clears throat> he was proactive. He was proactive in reaching him and getting to him. We cannot just hope that something good happens in the next generation. We cannot just sit back and say, well, somebody will do something, or, or I hope that someone reaches them. It's just not going to be me. We have to be proactive in doing something. You know, we have, um, I, I, I believe it's about 100 to 120 people that volunteer in the Awana ministry to be leaders. That's an unbelievable number of people. We have about 35 that work in uh, the junior and senior high. We have people that work in the nursery and the children's wing. These are, these are people that have decided to be 
proactive. Now, that's in the church setting. <clears throat> Mom and dad, at home, we have to be proactive. We cannot sit back and hope that things turn out good for our family. We're going to have to, at some point, put down the remote in the iPad, and we're going to have to actively get involved with what's going on in their lives. When it comes to someone coming to Christ, they don't usually come to us. They don't usually come and say, hey, I just, you know, this has happened to me once in all of my years, and it happened right in this building. There was a funeral happening in this room, and Mike Metzger brought someone to the office and said, Vinny, I'm getting ready to start the funeral. This guy wants to know how he can, how he can be forgiven of his sins. Can you do that? I said, well, not right now. No, I, and I, but I was like, wow, I, I've never had this before. I, I've never had someone come to me and say, hey, already, go ahead and just kind of give them the answers. But this doesn't, see, if we're going to have to be proactive to reach them. We can't sit back and hope for the best. And that's what this father did. He was proactive, and he reached out. He, he made his way down that path. But the second thing that we see about the dad was that he was genuine. In verse number 20, it goes on to say this, that he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. No high fives, no fist pumps. This was an all-out embrace. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying in, to illustrate this that uh, we need to go out into the foyer today and grab every kid we see and start hugging them. You might find yourself in a four-by-four, four, okay? I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. But what this is saying is we have to be genuine See, genuineness is very difficult to fake for very long. You and I can say, hey, how you doing? And we can blow right by that person and not even give them the opportunity of answering the question of how they're doing. See, that's a lack of genuineness. And if we are going to reach people for Christ, and if we're going to reach the next generation, we have to be beyond that facade and that fakeness. We have to be genuine. And when this son came close enough, the dad grabbed a hold of him. And I can only imagine the embrace that happened. And probably the weeping on his shoulder. See, because we're told that he assumed that he was dead. This, was, this is my son who was dead, he will say in a few moments. And only, not all of us can even understand that. Or the loss of a child, the disappearing of a child, or a child who's gone off to live their own way. This father finally got his son back, and he fully embraced him. No one wants to be patronized. No one wants to be talked down to. No one wants the facade. No one, I've experienced this, and you probably have too, when someone's nice to you, and all of a sudden they go off with their group, and they're kind of looking, and you, you just get that sense that they're giving them some more information, something about you that wasn't as positive. No one likes that. We need to be genuine. This dad was genuine. But not only that, the third thing we see about him was that the dad was gracious. Look at verse number 22. It says, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. This boy must have, this boy must have been as broke as you can be. When he returned home, he didn't even have a pair of shoes on. He didn't have a coat to put on. And when he and dad were together and he was hugging him, and the, the son started to give his rehearsed speech. See, before he came home, he said, this is what I'm going to say to dad. I, I've got to make sure this sounds right. I've got to make sure that I'm, that I'm honest, but I've got to make sure he understands I am so sorry. And he kind of like went through this planned speech. And when he's in dad's arms now, he starts to give his speech. He says, dad, I have left home. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against God. I am so sorry. And in the planned speech, he was supposed to say, hey, I'm willing to become a servant only, not a son, if you just take me home. And when they were embracing and the son was giving his speech, the dad put his finger over his lips and said, that's enough. He didn't even get to that point about being a servant. The dad knew where he was going. He looked over at the servants. He said, hey, bring the best robe that we've got. Get a pair of shoes. Get a ring. And then he said this, he said, bring the fatted calf. I don't know about all this, but I have a sense that dad was probably sneaking out at night. He was probably putting a little bit of extra grain in this one animal's stall. He probably, as an older guy, was thinking, I know that I own the place, but he probably looked around a few times to make sure no one was looking. 
dump the extra bucket in there. And all along, I'm thinking in his mind, he is anticipating that if my son comes home or when my son comes home, we're going to have a party. And this animal right here is going to be it. And he looks at his servants, he says, go get the fatted calf. And we're going to kill him and we're going to have a party. And he does. The dad was so gracious Remember, this is the same dad that had a dagger stabbed into his chest. This son basically said, when he asked of his inheritance, he said, Dad, I know you're not, but I wish you were dead so I could have that money. That's that's the request that he was giving. And this same dad, in his grace and in his love for his son, said, all that's in the past. It's forgiven. And he gave his son what he did not deserve. He gave his son what he hoped for, but not what he deserved. And you and I get that every day. But when we came to Christ, we got everything we didn't deserve. We got all of the forgiveness, all of the acceptance, all of the love, all of the hope, all of the dreams, everything that we can imagine. And that's a picture of who God the Father is. And this dad was a generational missionary. He gave what was not deserved. Sometimes we look around at at people in our society and we think, what a bunch of idiots. Can you believe that they would do that? Can you believe they would say that? Look at how they're living. And we look at, well, we don't look at the newspaper. That's kind of extinct. But we look at the news and we're thinking, wow, look how bad our society is. And then we can sit there and say this, what do we expect? See, what do we expect from them? They don't know any better. They don't have the Holy Spirit guiding them. They don't have have an understanding of the Bible that gives the guidelines. And we sit there and we cast our judgment and we, 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 we are critical of them. And we say, I mean, forget it. Even so come, Lord, because these people are just as lost as can be. And we lack the same gracious heart that God the Father has that is represented in this story. Sometimes we, we, sometimes we resemble that within the walls of the church. Not just our, I'm talking about the church of America. Sometimes we are so critical of the younger generation. We're so critical of the things that they do, the things that they like, the way that they respond. And, and, and listen, <laughs> they are simply living out what we have given to them. The path that we have cut into the woods for them to follow is what they're following. And we look at them and we blame them and we slap them around and God says, you cut the path. Where's the grace? Where's the love? Where's the acceptance? And this is what the Father gave. It's often the odd, it's often the outcast, it's often the the strange one that God is seeking out the most. It was the adventurous son who wandered off and, as his older brother will accuse him of, lived with the harlots and wasted all of his dad's money. That's the one God was seeking for. That's the one God wanted. That's the one we usually put on our pegboard and throw the darts at. God says, that's the one I'm looking for. So this dad was proactive, he was genuine, and he was gracious. He wanted to reach that generation But now we go to the darker side of our story. That part of the bitter brother. His story begins in verse 25. The party has begun. The son has come home. The dad is hugging him. And man, the music is playing. And it is a block party. Uh, Everyone knows what's going on. As a matter of fact, it's loud enough that on this, this ranch, the son can hear in the distance something crazy. Something that hasn't happened in quite some time. And it says in verse number 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Now here's the heart of the older brother. Verse 28 says, And he was angry. And he pouted, and he sat down, and he refused to go in. I added a few things in there. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. 
And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. The darkened heart of the older brother, the bitter brother. We see two things about him. Number one, he was disconnected. We saw, we saw again, verse number 28, that he was angry and he wouldn't even go in. He stayed outside. He refused to enter the house where this boy was, his younger brother. No, it, not at all, no sense of, of, of happiness that the person they assume to be dead is alive. Only anger at what he had done. He was a bitter man. Reading from the beginning of the chapter, we discover that this is representing the Pharisees. See that group of bitter and critical people that were standing in front of Jesus when, he, when the chapter started? These are the people that he's representing by the bitter brother. He wants them to understand that their heart is radically different than his. While his heart is seeking for the lost and for those that have intentionally wandered off, their heart's more concerned with tradition. Their heart is much more consumed with make sure, making sure we protect everything and keep all the bad people away. Don't get contaminated. And he wanted to make sure they understood the wrongness of this kind of heart. He was disconnected. Let me say this in a practical sense. The only way you and I will love people that are like this, that are outcast, is by spending time with them. See, when you and I keep a distance and we look at them from a distance and we watch our news and we look at these people, we're just frustrated by them. We're just thinking, well, man, they should know better. But it's not until you and I get close and we start to hear their story that all of a sudden we're like, wow, this person really has been through a lot. I, f I feel for them. And all of a sudden things start to change. Do you know that the most critical people in any church are those that sit on the sides and just watch what's happening? Those are the most critical. It's the people who sit out and will not get involved, who sit on the bench and say, I just don't like what's happening. I don't like where things are going. I don't like the way they do this. And the most critical people are those who are not involved. Man, I have had to put my foot in my mouth more times than I care to tell you criticizing somebody or the way someone did something until I had a conversation with them and I realized that's the only choice they had. And also I was like, oh, sorry, and I have to back off. The most critical are the people who are less or not involved at all. Until you and I find a place to jump in and find a way of getting close to, to the people that we're talking about, whether it's at work or whether it's here in the church with the next generation, we have got to get close enough to understand their circumstances, to feel what they're going through. Do you know, before we, before we get too far on this and think, well, I think you're going too far, is that not what Jesus did? Did he not become a man, according to Hebrews, so that he could feel all the points of our infirmities? So that he could understand the frailty of living in this flesh? He wanted to understand so that he could be a compassionate high priest. And he stuffed himself, he stuffed eternity into a baby's body. I can't even imagine the claustrophobia that he must have felt. But he did it because he wanted to get close. It's so difficult or even impossible to reach people or love people from a distance. This, younger, this older brother was disconnected. He did not want to get close. He kept his distance. The second thing we see about him is that he was self-centered. In verse number 20, 29, it says, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. And if you read on that one sentence that he gives in that, in, in that verse... He uses the word I three times, me once and my once. You talk about a self-centered person who is bragging on his own accomplishments in life. And the fact is, when we read the story, he's saying, I've never messed up once. And you've never congratulated me. Well, obviously, 
he had messed up somewhere or the dad would have recognized that. He was self-centered. He wanted everything to be the way he wanted it to be. And sometimes you and I, in, in the churches in America, we hold on to our traditions and the way we do things as a generation. We hold on to them like a wallet in the subway system of New York City. Man, we guard that stuff. And we don't like change. And we don't like the way the next generation is doing things. And like the older brother, we're very protective. We don't want anything to happen. We don't want to get contaminated. I laugh at this. I'm kind of in the middle, I guess. But I laugh at this because everyone is a family. See, in any family, in any home, we learn how to deal with all these adjustments and these changes and the things that happen. Our differences, when it's in love, our differences don't divide us. They actually bring us together. When I look at all the I look at the three girls that I have, and I look at the different personalities, I understand that that difference is the glue that brings us all together. And there are times when you and I are so staunchly protective of, of not changing, but the fact is, the way we did church when I was a teenager was different than the way they did church when my dad was a teenager. My generation changed it too. And the generation before that changed things too. And sometimes we fail to, to recognize we changed things, but now we're not going to let someone else change. And we're like the older brother who is like protected at all costs. God says seek the lost at all costs. We say protect our traditions at all costs. See, we do choirs and they do flash mobs. We do face to face and they do FaceTime. We email and they text. We watch TV and they watch Netflix. We dial the phone, they ask Siri. We built a desk for our computer and they carry their computer in their pocket. And you know, they prefer flashier music and they choose casual dress. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is there anything in scripture that's being broken? Is there anything that God has said very clearly cannot change that we're worried about changing? Or are we looking at things that we're comfortable with? It's the way I did it, man. I just, this is the way I'm, I'm comfortable like this. And I don't want to change. Every generation has to make these decisions. And if it's not wrong, if it's not something God has condemned, then let's start working with them. God is a pioneer of change. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we have the New Testament? Aren't you glad that we don't have to carry an animal to the temple anymore? Aren't you glad we don't have to slaughter our own animals for our sins? Can you imagine? I don't know how, about you, but I, I can't imagine how many animals I would be responsible for killing if I had to kill one for every bad thought. I, I, don't, I just can't even imagine living there. And I am so glad that God is a pioneer of change. When, when Caitlin was younger, <clears throat> she's about four years old, uh, I wasn't there, but they, uh, they went shopping, wherever Jim is right now. They went shopping together. And Caitlin's adventurous curiosity kicked in. And she decided on this day that they were going to play a little bit of uh, hide and seek. So while Kelly was shopping a rack and she was looking at some things, and Caitlin was right here, and in that split second, Caitlin's game kicked in and she hid immediately behind a white pillar that was just over here in, in the store. And as Kelly was all of a sudden sensing as a mother does, Kelly, Caitlin was no longer there and she said panic kicked in. Um, old fashioned Amber Alert was you run through the aisles looking and opening up the, the clothing racks and you start, you start going. And, and you might even run to, to one of the workers and say, hey, you've got to announce whatever, you know. And, and her panic mode kicked in, and one other gracious customer who was, who was shopping right near here said, ma'am, ma'am, are you looking for a little girl with ponytails? She said, yes. She said, she's um, kneeling down behind that white pole right there. And in that moment of rescue, when Kelly grabbed Caitlin, it wasn't 
a time of saying, remember this morning when you didn't put away your clothes? And you remember it? It wasn't a time of, of, of bringing up all the past. It was a time of celebration and hug. Whew. My daughter that was lost has been found. And you know that's the heart that God wants you and I to have. Number one, for those in our society, those that we work with, those that we, that we drink coffee with, those that we, we get gas from, God says have a heart of compassion to reach them. Don't look at all the tattoos and the outer, and, and all the stuff they got hanging off them and all the, the, the things, that the, the words they use and the cussing and all that stuff. He says listen to the heart of a rescuer and do all that you can to reach them. And God talks to us as a church. He says, I want you to recognize the younger generation. They might do things differently. He said, but I want you to have the, the heart of a rescuer. Don't let all those things cloud the, 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 the way in front of you. Understand that they have a heart that needs to be reached. And God is calling out to us as a church to be like the father in the prodigal son and not like the older brother. But you know, some, sometimes we have to sit back. We don't have to be a full-fledged older brother, do we? We can have some of the same character qualities at some points of that older brother. And God's asking you and I to change that. God wants us to change. We're going to sing one more song. It's a little bit of a special, I guess, so if you know the words, you're more than welcome to sing along. But the, the, the words, the title of the song is Who Will Rise Up? And it's a song to the church of asking this question, are you willing to do something? You say, well, what can I do? What, what can I do at this point? I, I'm not really sure of, of I have the talent or the, the, the ability. But listen, let me give you two things. Number one, be a cheerleader. Be a cheerleader of people who work in children's ministries or in youth ministries be a cheerleader of them. Find a way of encouraging them. Write them a note. Be a cheerleader of some kids. But number two, adopt one of them. What I mean by that is, is pick one, pick two, and say throughout this year, I'm going to do all that I can for this school year to encourage and to love and to express a care for them from my generation. Some people are actively involved and some people are on the outside. Let's find a way that we can do something. While this song is being sung, I have some three by five cards here and along the back uh, banister there. Um, this is what I'm asking you to do. I just want you to take a moment to, to grab one of those if God's leading you to and to write down the name of that person. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a teacher here in the building, maybe it's a, one of the children that you will intentionally love on this year, that you will be gracious to, that you will not sit back anymore and be disconnected, but you're going to do all that you can. So while this song is being sung, you can make your way either here or on the back banister, grab one of those, and I want to challenge you to write down the name of a, of a child or a student or one of their teachers, and I want you to proactively do all that you can. Let's rise up as a church.